Welcome to the final installment of this series on alchemy. Today we're going to be looking at really two main things. We're going to be looking at uh, the VA section of this, which is the, the vintage analog section. And we're going to be looking at the morph section. And so I think that between the two of those things, there'll be uh, some interesting things to talk about and to demonstrate. And honestly, if I'm looking for like analog-ish type sounds in Logic, then this is the place that I'm typically going to. Um, if I'm looking for something super easy, I go to RetroSynth. If I'm looking for uh, something that's kind of a mix between analog-ish synthesis, obviously this is all digital, but analog-ish synthesis with vector synthesis, then I go to... Um, one of the other synthesizers, in this case, it would be the ES2, which is a, a real classic subtractive synthesis tool, but it has vector synthesis in it. Um, if I just want, you know, some really raw power sounds, uh, then I come here to Alchemy. Because above all else, this thing has the heart of a subtractive synthesis uh, synthesizer. And so I think there's a lot to it that uh, is worth talking about. This is that final option. It doesn't require any import. Uh, we have a bunch of different uh, simple uh, wave shapes that we can use. All the traditional saw, sine, square, triangle. We have complex ones that have a whole range of things. Um, some pulse, you know, square wave-ish type things. Some saw, saw shapes, including some vintage ones that I go to a bit some sine wave options, including some triangles, and then a bunch of square waves. Okay, so those are like uh, what we would use as our building blocks for uh, synthesis. Now here's kind of the deal. Um, because we have these four sound sources, and each one of them can have uh, another one of these oscillators loaded, and we have a unison mode. Now if you don't know what unison mode is, this allows us to essentially duplicate the voice a certain number of times. And so I've got each of these voices turned up to 16. That means it's gonna be playing 16 on each of these sound sources, and they're all slightly detuned, so they're not like perfectly in sync, a little bit of tuning on each of them. Um, so that means uh, between 16 on the first one, uh, 32 with the next one, um, 64 with all four of them. So we get some really monster, super saw kind of things happening with this. Um, now I've got each of them panned a little bit out. Well, I got A panned all the way to the left, D panned all the way to the right, B and C a little bit to the left and the right. Um, I don't have any filters going yet. It's literally just four different shapes, a saw, a sign, um, looks like another saw, and then a buzz, right? So those are the four, and we'll listen to those a little bit more in a second, but I'm gonna just turn this down a hair because this is actually pretty loud. Um, and then I have the arpeggiator going up just in a cycle, and I have a, a classic reverb, which I'm not sure I like right this second. I might actually switch that out, but um, I'm gonna leave it there because that's what I had for a second. So listen to this sound. Um, this, again, is just those four sources, a little bit of panning, the unison, and then an arp and a reverb. I mean, massive sound. I don't know how loud that sounds on your end, but... I have that turned down a little bit. It's clipping everything. Um, so you have to do a little careful gain staging, but uh, it's just amazing how these all, these all sound. So let's just turn off all but one of them. You'll hear it's panned. Let me just pan that back to the center with an option click. Let's turn off the art for a minute and just actually listen a little bit. We'll turn off the reverb too. And I have the whole thing set to mono mode, although 
we can set it up to 32 voices. So right there I played four notes, each of them with 16 uh, because of the unison on each of those voices. And then, uh, so we're back up to 64 again with just four notes played on the keyboard. If I turned on all of these and I played those same four notes, uh, we're going to be at 64 times four. So sorry if that's loud. I know someone out there is saying loud. Um, I'll turn it down a little bit more so I don't just like kill anybody. And that's a lot of voices all happening simultaneously. Um, I don't think we're really going to be doing too much in terms of the overall CPU, but let's just take a peek as I do that again. Nah, like a quarter of one of the threads, so not that bad. So all of the power that you'd ever want in one place in terms of sub subtractive synthesis. Uh, we have things with symmetry, uh, phase, and sync. All of those, again, are traditional subtractive synthesis uh, tools, and it makes working with this, you know, pretty much a replacement for anything else I would need at any given time. On top of that, three filters for each of the sound sources, plus um, we have a filter, well, two filters on the global amount. So. Um, right off there, that means with each of the voices having their three, uh, which means we have 12 total, then the other two. So we have 14 filters in play. I mean, nothing else is uh, very few hardware synths are you going to run up against that right off the bat. Of course, digital world, software stuff, everybody's doing everything. But we have a lot of really cool um, filter options. And I know some people have shared this with me before. But uh, many of these are modeled off of uh, traditional analog filters, and um, I don't have the list, but someone told me that there's a list uh, of which ones they are. They've changed the names to be a little less identifying to those, but, um, you know, we have nine low passes, etc. cetera, band pass, high pass, so all of our filter types that we would want for subtractive synthesis. And not just basic ones, but ones that have various uh, shapes to them, various emphasis, and so you're actually able to get quite a few different things. 12 dB per octave, 24 dB per octave, and 60 dB per octave in that one. And then 6 and 12 for the band pass, and then the, um, the 6, 12, 24, and 60 for the high pass. So a toolkit of everything you'd ever want. Um... But that takes us into what the heck is the morph tool. And that's what I want to look at a little bit more right now because that's really um, subtractive synthesis. I'm not going to be able to teach it to you in one live stream. Um, there's certainly more to it than, than anything. But um, the morph tool is really cool. It takes all four of our sources and puts it into this, this, uh, the pad where we can move between them. So... We have several different types of things happening here. We have just the basic um, crossfade X and Y, and we also have the linear, which puts them in a row, right? So for instance, with this, again, we're pretty low on the volume, thank goodness. So this is essentially, because it's a crossfade, just a level change between them. It means some things are just being turned up and down, and um, there's not a lot more to it in that sense. So they are, if you put it on A, B, C, and D are just turned down in levels. And um, for instance, if we did B, and I just tuned this up,
And actually, I think it makes more sense in this case to do this with, um, with C because they're both sawtooth. We'll just do that. Go back to morph, push a note. <laughs> So in the middle, they're both playing a little bit, and as you go all the way towards C, then just C is playing and A is no longer playing. Same with this mode. It's a linear progression through those notes. Okay, cool. We get to morph. It's going between them in, in an incremental way instead of just a level way. One is not just being turned down. The parameters are actually being moved towards them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So on A, let's take the unison down. Just like that. So when it's on A, unison, one note, one voice. As we go down to C, it breaks it out to the 16 and also pitch adjusts it up to the other adjustment that we made in the pitch. So that's pretty cool. Um, we go back to here. Let's switch these back and forth. A few things to notice. One of them, we go from green to, well, we go from blue to green, right? Uh, the things that are green are the parameters that are going to change when we do this. And it says only certain parameters, this is from the manual, notably all parameters controlled with a knob can be morphed. So things that are, are knobbed can be controlled. Now you'll see down here we have some things that are, are knobbed, but uh, they're not green. Um, and so we're talking about these the synthesis parameters up in the sound sources. Um, let's see. Parameters that are morphed have a mutual assignment, show both an orange and a green arc around the control. Parameter settings are shared across all morph sources, which means that changing a parameter in one source results in the corresponding parameter being changed for all morphed sources. Okay, cool. Um... And there was a note here in the manual to parameters that do not directly participate in the morph, including most buttons and pop-up menus are indicated with a lock icon displayed at the top left of the control. So you can see that a little bit right here. There's a lock for the F1, F2 right there. I don't know if I see any more locks. Let's zoom back out for a second. Not on that page. Let's see on global. No. Those ones were not. So here's the thing. If the minute we leave the sources, the morph doesn't apply anyway, because the morph is just between the four sound sources, A, B, C, and D. So of course, nothing else is going to be in there because those aren't part of those four sources. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, we can do tuning and panning. Um, when I was over here, we can do, so yes, that is green. So those did work. The detuning works. The oscillator type does not. It has a little lock next to it. So that doesn't happen. And, um, but the volume, the symmetry, the phase, and the sync all are part of this. So a lot of these tools, are really cool tools, are available for this. Let's load up something else. So let's just pull out um, a soundscape. I'm just doing a random one for a moment. 
uh, mostly because I wanted to show you a few other locked examples. We can't turn on or off this particular filter type or effect type. We can't change the, the series or parallel nature of this. Cool. Uh, but we do have under granular, the granular effects we can morph between. So you see like tap spacing, stereo offset, the, the density of the grains, the size of the grains, uh, the random uh, time and the random pan. Um, so if you don't know what any of those things are, look back at the previous videos in the series, but those all have the, the knobbed green color, which means in the morph, we can do that. Oh, this is gonna, so this is a perfect, I picked the perfect patch on accident, of course. Look at that in the middle of the, the pad there. Let me zoom in. Oh, I'm not zoomed in the right place. That little dot is moving, right? That's um, because we've attached the X and Y knobs for the morph XY to modulation. So if I click on this, you'll see um, that we have this right here, XY pad 1X with the depth there. Um, and so it's actually, I don't know, let's see, show targets. There we are. So those two right there. Um, but they are, they're morphing due to modulation, not because of my control. I mean, that's pretty awesome sounding, right? And that's all because we have these four sound sources. Um, let's see, we, what we wanna do for a second, let's go to global. Oh, turning stuff off. A. B. C, and D. So those are the sounds. If you want to create something like this, you have to, you know, plan it out. Think about what you want for each of the sound sources and have them morphing between each other. Uh, I mean, this is the, that's the pretty cool part of this. Um, trying to think there's a few more applications we can do with this let's um just go to the next thing here you'll see the morph pad is not turned on okay so let's try this one for a second Let's do a default. Let's just initialize the patch for a second. And we'll just say we have these four saws. I just wanna show like a couple use points here. Um, one of them being if you have a joystick uh, on your keyboard or maybe not even joystick, just two knobs. Maybe I'll show with the knobs first before anything else anyway. Let's go down to our smart controls. We're just going to do a generic rack here. And for the first one, we're going to learn parameter and I'll just do this. Perfect. And I'll do an external assignment 
like this. And then, um, cancel, did I just, okay, we're good. No, we have to relearn the parameter. Oof. So that didn't morph all X. It should have worked, but. I wonder why that didn't. Let's do the next one real quick and just see. So I have, let's learn the parameter of the Y function here. Yeah, so that one's working. But the X one, I think when I hit the other button, let's relearn this real quick. Oh, it's because there's two of them on it, that's why. But now I got them. Okay, cool. So I'm using my two knobs, or if you have a joystick, just do the joystick. So my bigger keyboard, um, I've got three joysticks on it. And so I can just do one parameter and it works. I do have a joystick on this, but it's, um, it's, uh, has pitch and modulation on it. And so I'd have to actually reassign those. How you doing GigaDeath? Thanks for watching. Um, could you get into some industrial soundscapes? I mean, yeah, that's really this framework of alchemy can do anything. It just, you have to be able to either get the sound sources uh, and do it that way, or you have to like um, figure the, uh, like you have to b build the sound sources yourself. So it could be that um, you're doing something uh, with samples that you've created. So say you have like an expert of music. I think I don't have, um, Anything industrial off the top of my head in my own files right this second. I don't know if ooh, what we have inside Apple Loops, if I spell it correctly, maybe. So let's just do. Ooh, I don't know. So let's maybe take that sound and something rhythmic like that and actually combine those into two sound sources, which then we can morph between. Um, I think that that could work. Let me, I don't know if what I'm about to try will work because I'm always, yeah, it will. So we can pull straight from the Apple loops right out here and the source A and I want to do granular for that one. Cool. And then for C, let's do this one. Um, and I want to do maybe, I think I'm going to do granular for both. Well, spectral could be fun too. So I'm going to do spectral for that one. And now it's importing. I'll look at the other comment. Bitumen, thanks for doing these as always. I always at least try to pop in, but I'm thankful these videos upload after stream and are easy to look back on as well. You're welcome. And this is the last one of them, so yay. Um, but here... Oh man, I didn't really like how that one sounds. So let's re-import this one is granular. And here's what I want to do. I want to go D. I want to take the scary industrial again for granular. And for B, I want to do the same one um, as I did in A. So now A and B are the same. C and D are the same, except for on B, 
I want to do the pitch like down an octave. And on D, I'm actually going to do the pitch up an octave. And then for the morph, I'm going to switch this to the morph XY instead of the fade. Because I don't want them just to fade between the two. I want them to actually morph between the two. Now, I don't think this is exactly what you were looking for, Giga Death, but you're getting it anyway. And then you can, you know, fill this in with the actual types of music you're thinking of. Look at what it's doing right now. It's called computing time alignment. This is the processing that's creating the morph between what I just asked it to do. And this can, uh, it's actually going to not exactly render this in, but kind of render it in, in a way. So we play. Let's go up a couple octaves first. Let's go up. Oh man, those, some of those sounds are incredible. I think I have these on my knobs still, so I don't even have to do the mouse. Ah, oh, man, it's just like getting into the, it's like I need to plan these out a little bit more, but that's like really cool with what you can do with this. Putting those, different sounds. So you can even put all of one of those sounds in four different corners, um, the same exact thing in each one, but have them like be pitch shifted or time adjusted or speed adjusted, or, you know, you put your filter stuff on there, panning, um, on all of those things, you're going to be able to go through with it, including, um, which we're, we're on granular. So I can like change the size of the grains or, you know, the, the number of taps that are happening. Um, or with this one, they're all granular, but we have our speed adjustment here. So for instance, if I wanted to want to see, let's do a 200, uh, I'll just type it in, 200% speed change, right, on our more from A to C. Oh, I actually want to, let's do that on B. Got to keep track. I got to write down notes when I'm doing this kind of morphing. So it's like if I want to just like... right back so you can I mean you can come up with whatever you want all of this is automatable so you can literally just dump this out into your you know uh, some MIDI out here draw in the different pieces of automation you want um, because it's under either the smart controls which I assigned or alchemy directly um, I don't know so here is let's see where would it be Morph right there. It's right in front of my face. So we have morph, additive X, additive Y, all X, all Y, envelope X, Y, format X, Y, pitch X, Y, spectral X, Y. So we have all of those separate. So you can really do all of that um, in that way. But the morph, the morph tool by far is one of the, it's like that's why we're doing this last because you have to like kind of wrap your head around what all the sound sources are and then you realize that you can just do uh, pretty much endless variations or control variations using this particular part of the tool. And it really pulls it between it. The XY fade is okay. I like being able to fade between things sometimes, but the morph XY, this is when it gets into like sculpture crazy levels. Um, 
and so we have the the five morph pads on the sculpture plugin this one has the four but in my opinion we're looking at completely different beasts here in some ways let's see if we had any other comments gigadeth you need a whole weekend to do this i agree uh hey ali winter how you doing looks like all the all the regulars are in the room that's what we need Trying to think if there's anything else to cover with. I think there were a few more things there in this area. So the auto gain, fixed pitch, auto align. Um, those are three things that are important to at least be aware of. So let's cover those real quick. The auto gain button enables uh, to match source levels. So um, you get smoother morphs with that. So let's do auto gain. I don't think it needs to re... Okay, cool. Just make sure the levels are at least a little bit matched. Um, the fixed pitch button. Uh, so you lock the root note to a pitch that doesn't change regardless of morph position. Uh, I am actually going to turn that off. Cool, some really cool sounds. And then the auto align button is the last one. Enables to automatically align all morph sources. Um, this one's a little bit more vague, but I think I'm gonna try it off in a second because I think some of the things that I'm facing here are actually happening because that's on. Um, so the example the manual gives is that uh, auto align corrects the timing of words of four spoken voice samples. Um, so that way you have alignment between all those. But in some cases, we don't necessarily want that. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, I had it open a little bit a minute ago. I mean. It's not even spiking anything. Um, however, because when you first do this, when you first turn on the morph, it does a bunch of the processing. Uh, and I, I think that when you make some changes, uh, there are some things that have to happen. Um, let's do, instead of going down 12, let's go up 24 semitones, right? I mean, it didn't have to reprocess anything, so geez. And it's still not spiking. It's not even getting to like 10% of one thread. Um, it's pretty awesome. Uh, M transient. That's cool, Ellie Winter. Let me see what you're talking about. So, you're, I'm assuming you're talking about the Imelda production one. I loved I love this type of effect that you're talking about. There was one one effect that I used to use like all the time religiously called character, which I think is similar to that one. Um, but uh, I just there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. How do you like it? 
trans best transient algorithms you've ever seen. Oh, that I mean that's high praise. Cool. I'll have to check it out. I haven't used any of it. It looks a that like they're having some really amazing Cyber Week sales right now on there, and then um, looks like they're semi affordable even when it's not on sale. So awesome. I'll definitely check them out. I'm really slow to adopt new things. Uh, personally, I find the things that I really like and, and stick with them, but I'm always looking for other cool things. M Sound Factory. I'll check it out too. Cool. Any questions or anything else? I mean, this stream, we've been going about 35 minutes. It's designed to be the final stream about alchemy that um, I'll probably ever do until there's some sort of significant update. Um, I, I think alchemy is amazing, even though I feel like on this series of seven videos, each of them, uh, I think the average time is over 40 minutes for each one. Um, we did go on some, you know, some little conversation distract, distraction strolls, um, some bird walks, but um, I think overall we stayed on target and uh, really covered a lot of stuff with it. Um, it's an amazing tool and, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out which series for streaming, um, for my live streams that I'll do next. It won't be alchemy again for, like I said, for a while, because, uh, there's only so much that I'm interested in talking about it, but, um, it's a, it's a really powerful tool. I've learned a few things in this stream, which I, I hadn't really done much with, um, trying to think of what exactly, I think it was really when I got deeper into, you know, some of these specific tools, the out of spectral format, granular, um, and then the vintage analog oscillators. But, um, I think when I got into some of the weeds of that, I definitely, it was more like a reminder in many ways. I think all of this stuff you know, I've thought about or written about or talked about at various times, but it's like you don't use it every single day. It kind of like fades away a little bit. Um, but it's like one of those tools. It's you, and to be a master at alchemy, you have to like use it a bunch, but it doesn't fit in every situation. So a lot of people don't use it all that much. So it ends up being really the thing that I haven't talked about at all, which is just a, a bunch of presets. I mean, we're looking at, 3,631 different presets. That's a lifetime of exploration right there all by itself. So, hey, Psyder, how you doing? Any, um, there's only a couple people on right now. It looks like some of you are just kind of coming and going a little bit, which is awesome. Um, trying to think if there was anything else that I wanted to really cover before ending this whole series on alchemy. Uh, if you're still watching Gigadeth, thanks so much for the, the super chat. That's always super generous of you. All of you should be more like Giga Death. That's what that's what my view is. But let's see. We had it's been a smaller crowd a little bit today. Once again, I definitely um definitely posted that I was going live about eight minutes before I went live, and uh, that's. That's just how it goes sometimes. Uh, I wish that I, I still, my goal is to eventually do like a weekly thing at the exact same time every week. But I don't know if that's realistic and under my current circumstances. So we'll see. Oh, thanks again, Giga Death. Twice in one stream. Um, I'll try to, I think it's like maybe next time. I'm, I'm worried because I know... Like I, I track my numbers of views on these videos and uh, I know that some of these streams end up getting like 150 views total, which is pretty small 
amounts um, on a platform like YouTube where, you know, someone posts a picture of, you know, someone driving a dirt bike into the side of a mountain and falling off it and probably dying and it gets like 10 billion views. Um, so it's hard. I need to find a way to make sure that uh, the people who really want to see this get get to see it and, and YouTube doesn't just bury it because it's not as popular as a cat video. Um, but it's like going from alchemy, uh, the thing I can imagine next would be something like sculpture, which I've used sculpture much longer than I've used alchemy. Uh, and I really, really, I reach for that tool more often than I do alchemy uh, because of the sounds it creates. Um, and Giga Death, I'm thinking about Patreon, actually. I've done Patreon in the past, never consistently, meaning um, I've done it, but um, I haven't pushed it consistently or had, like, consistent rewards. Uh, or, you know, Patreon works on, like, a series of, like, levels of what people get to do. Um, I just need to, again, sit down for a weekend and actually sort all that out and, and, and make sense of it so that the Patreons get like this kind of content. So it's like the Patreons know when the live streams are going to be in advance and they get to show up and participate and ask questions and do everything like that's more personalized. And then the average viewer just gets to watch the replay later. I mean, that's more what I'm thinking in some ways. Um, I mean, I think it's valuable to like five or $10 a month to have a, a university professor teach you like a live stream class twice or four times a month. You know what I mean? It's like college. I know what it costs for our students to go to the University of Colorado, Denver. And um, I mean, tuition is pretty pricey. Uh, but to be able to have experts, not just me, but anybody who does this in a streaming format, it's like you're not talking to me, but uh, it's like you get to ask questions in the chat and I, you know, I give answers and do demonstrations and things. I mean, certainly there's got to be an audience for this because um, I know some of you keep on coming back over and over and over. And it's like, you're the, the loyal group who's who's really interested and, and wants to learn. And um, there's this thing that YouTube has announced that they're going to be doing in 2023 uh, which is not that far away, but we'll see when they actually do it. It's an education part of YouTube where like content creators like me get to create courses. And then there's like quizzes and tests on YouTube to actually like make sure you're learning. The whole point of a quiz or a test is to reinforce memorization or actual learning. Um, so, you know, if you do it right, it can be really useful in the process. Um, and I think content creators will be able to monetize those modules, I, I'm not as, I mean, I, I'm a monetized channel. I, I get a little bit of money every month, but, um, it's not my day job. My day job is what pays the bills teaching. Um, but I, I certainly think that there's gotta be a nice sweet spot, um, where people are like, you know what? I, I would love to help support, you know, some of this content creation and, um, and then they get like special things like that actually mean something. They don't just like, you know, get a bunch of videos online. They actually get interaction with, with the teachers and they, they get feedback. It's like, I would love on Patreon to start a place where people bring their projects. And it's like, we do, we mix together and make their stuff sound good, um, better than, than it would have without it. I mean, that's the, you need a benefit. If you bring a project to someone and it doesn't sound any better than what you could do on your own, like, why are you bringing it? Like, what's the whole point? Anyway, we're, I think I'm rambling on, we've almost hit the 45 minute mark, which is where I try to hit with each of these videos. And sometimes we went more. Um, I agree with your last comment cider. If you're, yeah, if you're still here, I'm shocked how little, People use alchemy as well. I hear a lot of um, other names of synths that people are like, ooh, this one's the best, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, what are you using? And I'm like, the presets are incredible. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Stop using presets all the time. Like actually go in there and create something. 
like make something that's yours that uh that sounds exactly what you want for something don't just open up a preset play it and like be like inspired because somebody else did all the work not that that's wrong all the time i mean i use certain presets but um you know my favorite preset on my last project was not an alchemy it was one that surprised me it's um inside retro synth and if you've seen many of my videos you know that i really do like retro synth quite a bit um, there are some strengths to having simplicity in your life and this is definitely an example but they had I'm trying to think where it was i know what it's called the berlin experience <laughs> I mean, I really liked the sound. It's really simple, but it worked really well on a couple projects. And so um, that's the kind of thing. Sometimes a preset is exactly what you need, but you, I think at the bare minimum, if you're using a preset that you really like, the next step should be dissecting it so you could create that on any other instrument that you're using. Okay, let's pull the plug on this one. Um, I'm going to look in. I've got some other uh, video ideas I'm going to be doing um, over the next couple weeks. I'm probably still going to be live streaming because live streaming is like the thing I'm doing right now. Uh, more than I do make some other videos that are non-live stream, but I just the interaction is what's making some of this, uh, the content creation more bearable. Talking to people, asking questions, getting responses. I mean, that's that's uh, the whole point for me of this this platform is the interaction with like an amazing group of people. So keep that part up, keep coming and uh, you know, we'll start making stuff. I do think just in my head that the next series I wanna do is all about sculpture because that's one of my favorites. And so I think that that's what my next series will be. And for those of you who have not really used sculpture much, um, it's time not just to use it in stereo, but to also use it with its surround capabilities, to use it as like a vocoder type instrument with its side chain, to use the morph pad. I mean, this instrument can do stuff that, uh, that very few other instruments in the world can do. And um, I think, I like alchemy because of the power and but it's it's pretty traditional in many ways this is a very non-traditional instrument um, in terms of software instruments and so i think that's where we'll go next we'll see it's always up in the air i gotta go um see you all later thanks for coming and um i'll catch you on the next stream